All right, good evening everyone. Welcome to Devotions on this, uh, what are we, Tuesday night? Yes, Tuesday night. Hope and pray that you had a great day and uh, you're looking forward to uh, just a nice restful evening. And good morning to those of you who watch in the morning, especially Kurt and Donna, God bless you, and for anyone else, and for anyone else. But I know Kurt and Donna watch early in the morning as they're heading off to work at the wee hours of the morning. So good morning to you all. All right. I'm going to go back to uh, the book of Philippians. There was a couple of things that I wanted to finish off through Philippians. And no, I'm not still reading Philippians. I am actually somewhere else. I actually started through the Gospels again. So I'm in Matthew and I'm looking for already in chapter one. Oh, man, Lord, I was reading this morning. Lord, help me to read. Help. I said, Lord, help me to read this with fresh eyes. And I've prayed that a few times and God is blessed. And I really enjoyed, Sister Jean, good evening. Really enjoyed the first chapter of uh, of the book of Matthew. So looking forward to going through that. So yes, I am somewhere else. But there was a couple of things that I wanted to finish off in the book of Philippians chapter 4. All right, now. <clears throat> hey, Judy, good evening. Uh, who likes school? Anyone like school? <laughs> there will probably be a few of you that really enjoyed school. I, I, I didn't mind school. Um, I left too early. I know that. I, I should have stuck it out. I left too early. I left at 15 and went to work. I should have hung out, but I didn't. I didn't. I, I didn't have a bad experience at school. Um, you know, it was good. I mean, I enjoyed it. Sue Ellen, good evening. Uh, finished my schooling off at a Christian school. But, uh, you know, had some, uh, had some great teachers through the years. I remember in, uh, in grade six, Seven, grade seven, there was a teacher by the name of Mr. DeYoung, and uh, his fame was he was a crack shot with the chalk or the blackboard rubber. I mean, if you were sitting up the back of the classroom and you weren't paying attention and you were talking to your mate, you'd get that, you'd, man, that chalk would come flying or that, that blackboard duster would hit your fair and, and uh, couldn't do it today. But uh, this is the 80s, folks. This is, this is when kids were tough. I mean, not like now, it's like, oh my goodness, you can't do anything now. Anyway, yeah, chalk or rubber, the blackboard rubber come flying across, the road, whack, and you get your attention. Hey, John, good evening. Uh, and then, uh, and then uh, <laughs> earlier than that, when I was, uh, again, still in primary school, we had a teacher by the name of Mr. Good. And uh, heaven help us, if we would say the word goody around Mr. Good, if we said goody, we'd get a detention. And uh, that wasn't his only claim to fame, not that he was very insecure about his last name. Uh, but he had, the, he, had the, he had the wildest look at eyebrows. I mean, those things were so feral. I reckon there, was an, there were animals living in there. I reckon they were, oh, that, I mean, for a kid, <laughs> they were pretty bad. Uh, and so you would be looking at him and there'd be these eyebrows just like, you know, whoa, look out, you know. Uh, so Mr. Good, yeah, and then I had, uh, th then I had a, a high school principal, Mr. Linden. Mr. Linden was an Englishman. He actually was in the English military, and oh, <laughs> he, he ran, he ran the school like it was his own private little army. You know what I mean? He'd be standing there when the school bus would come in, and and you, he'd, if we weren't dressed in our uniform, wow, you'd get a detention. We had to. We had to, uh, you know, when uh, chapel was on or we were all in our lines, we had to stand at attention. And we had to stand like we were in the army with your thumbs down. You, weren't, you, had, you had like, wow, you know. And uh, I, I remember him. Uh, and then there was, um, then the, the vice principal's name was Mr. Hunter. Mr. Hunter. He looked like he was someone from the Smurfs. <laughs> Papa Smurf. <laughs> oh, the things that you remember. Uh, but anyway, it was meant to be serious. We were meant to be learning, right? And we did, you know, you go to school and you learn and, you know, you graduate from uh, from high school and, and some go straight on to college or TAFE or university. Uh, I went to work and then I went to Bible college and graduated. But we all know this. We all, Yeah, right. <laughs> you was a perfect student. Now repent of your sin, John. Perfect student, um, you know. And but we all know this: when just because you finish whatever schooling education you had, you never stop learning. You never stop learning. Well, you shouldn't anyway. We should always be people that are willing to learn, especially as Christians. 
As Christians, we should be people that are always wanting to learn more and more, and especially, obviously, about our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, in Philippians chapter 4, in Philippians chapter 4, Paul tells us of his uh, education experience. <laughs> My, didn't he have an education experience? I mean, he, he, uh, he, I mean, we looked at his CV a few, uh, was it last week, I think it was, or, you know, and, uh, you know, he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. I mean, he was educated in, in probably one of the best schools. I mean, Hebrew of the Hebrews and all of that, right? But the best education that he got really was on the backside of the desert when Jesus gave him special revelation concerning the New Testament, right? And the books that he was to write and so on. Uh, but that wasn't the only time. In, in, in throughout his life, the Lord uh, used, Susan, good evening. The Lord used situations or conditions to educate. All right. Now listen to this in Philippians chapter four. He says, verse nine. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned. See that? Notice that. I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to abate, to be abased, which means to have nothing, right? I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. So here we've got Paul now letting us know about his education. I have learned in whatsoever state I am. And we're not talking about Victoria, New South Wales. We know that, all right? He's talking about his not just his situation, but the conditions. And here is the thing. God uses the conditions in your life to teach you contentment. God uses the conditions in your life to teach you contentment. And uh, contentment is one of those things that we are always at school. Someone once said, the school of suffering graduates rare scholars. The school of suffering graduates rare scholars. Some of the best lessons in life are learnt while you're going through certain conditions. Uh, certain seasons of life, we learn much about the Lord, and we should. We learn much about our God. We learn much about the Holy Spirit. We learn much about ourselves, especially in the area of contentment. Uh, we are to be content when we're abounding, and we're to be content when we are abased or when we're suffering need. Why? Because both conditions always want more. The, 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 the person who is struggling, the person who is a base, the person who has nothing is always wanting more, right? However, the, the person that is abounding, and you would think, well, you've got a lot, but the problem in human nature is this is that sometimes enough is never enough. As a matter of fact, with that thought in mind, hold your place if you're in the Scriptures in Philippians chapter 4. Go back with me to the book of Proverbs. I'm going to look at a couple of uh, Scriptures here in Proverbs. So the people that have uh, abound in, in much, they often say, you know, uh, I don't have enough, I want more, I want more. And... Uh, and sometimes we hear that, uh, that there are those in life that are just like that. And uh, he says in Proverbs chapter 30, I believe it is. I need to find it in a moment. Uh, look at verse number, uh, let me see, let me see, let me see, let me see. Look at verse number 12, Proverbs 30, 12. There is a generation that are pure in their own eyes and yet is not washed from their filthiness. All right? There is a generation, how lofty are their eyelids? He goes on about he goes on about these generations. All right, uh, verse fourteen. This is a generation whose teeth are as swords; their jaw teeth as knives to devour the poor from off land. Right now, look at verse fifteen. Listen to this. 
The horse leech, the horse leech hath two daughters crying, give, give. There are three things that are never satisfied, yea, four things say not, it is enough. The grave and the barren womb, the earth that is not filled with water, and fire that saith, it is not enough. Now here is the problem. We have a generation that really says, it's not enough. I want more. I'm not satisfied. I, 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 and this is, this is those that, not only those who lack want more, but those who are abounding they're never satisfied with what they've got. They're always looking for more. They're looking for the, the next best deal. They're looking for the next best money opportunity or whatever it is. What can I do to get more, 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 more? This is the generation that we live in also. We, 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 we're actually living in a day where you've got those who are based and those who are abounding. It seems like that there is no middle man. You know, there isn't a, this middle Australia. You either have or you have not. It's a very problematic situation. But if you look at Proverbs chapter 30, we're there. Look at verse 8 and 9. Verse 8 and 9. He says this. Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty, right, nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me, lest I be full and deny thee, and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of my God in vain. When he's talking about feed me with things that are convenient, he's basically saying, just give me enough that I can be content. Can I ask you a question tonight? Are you content? Are you content in the condition that you're in? I'm not talking spiritually. I think spiritually we ought to be striving. I mean, God wants us to learn more about him, and this is why he allows... You and I do go through certain conditions in life so that we can learn contentment, okay? There is such a danger, there is such a danger in regards to discontentment. Uh, discontentment will drive you away from where you ought to be. Did you get that? Discontentment will drive you away from where you ought to be. The person who's discontented in a relationship is looking for the next best thing. The discontented person has this thought in mind. The grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. And in reality, we all know that it's not. We've all seen cattle. We've all seen sheep and goats uh, sticking their head through the fence, eating the grass on the other side of the fence when the grass that is on their side is just the same. But for some reason, they've got to stick their head through the fence to eat that grass. The grass is not always greener on the other side of the fence. People get discontented in the churches that they're in and, and being in ministry for just a little while now, I've, I've seen that. They get discontent and the discontentment drives them away from where they ought to be. You get discontented in a job. You've been, you've been working hard for a long time at the same job, same place, whatever it is, and, 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 and you believe that you're next in line for a promotion or whatever, and someone else gets it, and you get worked up, and you get, and, and, and you're same old, same old. I'm in this rut, and I'm, I'm just discontented where I'm at, and it drives you away from where God is meant to have you. I remember doing that in a job. Is actually the job that I was working at while I was in Bible college. It was a great boss, easy job. Yes, it was driving, and I was like, "No, nah, I'm fed up with this. I, I, I want to look at something else. I want to go somewhere else." I had enough, and there was a av job advertised uh, driving for a uh, just tipper work and all this sort of stuff. And I thought, "I'm going for that. I'm going for that. This is what I want to do." Now, no, now listen. Here's the thing. People that are discontented that go looking elsewhere, they never say, oh, it's me, it's me. It's, oh, I just believe the Lord's leading me. And they throw the name of the Lord. I just believe the Lord's leading me on. Oh, okay. All right. Well, just let's see how that works out. Okay. Man, I got so discontented where I was and I went looking for another job. It was the worst thing in the world. <laughs> it was a shocker. Anyway, I know what discontentment can do. Drove me away. I, 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 
brother Kurt and sister Donna who will watch tomorrow probably, and uh, you know they love the book. I love the book. I I love the bush. I probably don't love it as much now, but man, when I was younger, I wanted to leave Adelaide. I wanted to leave church. I wanted to leave everything behind me. I'm going bush. I just hate the city. I'm going bush. I was discontented with where I was at, and that didn't lead to good things either. So be careful. The dangers of discontentment. We're in Proverbs. Here's another verse. Go to Proverbs chapter 27 when it talks about driving you away. Look at Proverbs 27, the book of wisdom. Hey, Les, good evening. In Proverbs 27 and verse number 8, the Bible says this, As a bird that wandereth from her nest, so is a man that wandereth from his place. As a bird that wanders from her nest, so is a man that wanders from his place. Discontentment will get you to wander from where God intends for you to be. When a bird, when a bird takes off and, and wanders from her nest, she's not at rest. And when you wander from your place through discontentment, you won't find rest. It's not until the bird comes back to her nest where she can settle and be at rest. And so it is with us, brethren, if, if, if we allow that discontentment to drive us from our place, we wander about in the wilderness, we're looking around for the next best thing and whatever it is, and, and we're wandering, we're not resting, we're, we're, we're all over the place, and it's not until we make a decision to come back, whether it's to God or whatever it is, that's where we find rest. I do believe, and I love the prodigal son, I was saying this to, I think I said this to Brother Liz yesterday, I love the prodigal son. It may be that it was discontentment that drove him from the father's house. Oh, he'd been brought up in the farm. All he'd known was farm life. Going out every day, just like Moses on the backside of the desert, going out every day, feeding the chickens, tending to the goats or the sheep, wandering them out here, taking them to the same place, seeing the same hills, seeing the same bushes, Oh, it was just the same thing every day, day after day after day after day. It may have been discontentment that drove him from his place. May I encourage you, be careful of discontentment. Well, anyway, back in Philippians chapter 4, I want you to notice the attitude of the content. The attitude of the content. Verse 13, what a wonderful context that this is set in. <laughs> Philippians 4.13 has been tattooed on many a Christian's arm. Philippians 4.13, Philippians 4.19, whatever it is. But mostly Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. What an attitude. And Paul is saying this obviously in the conditions that he's in. He can, he can handle the condition because he can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth him, which strengtheneth me. I love the I can do attitude, don't you? I love people that have got that, hey, let's do it. We can do this. We can do this. And I, I love that I can do attitude. And some people say, well, you can do anything if you put your mind to it. Well, the problem with us as Christians is that we're not talking about the power of positive thinking. We, when it comes to Christians, you can do it if you put your faith to it. You can do it if you put your faith to it. I can do all things through Christ. It is Christ that gives you and I the strength to can do. We have no strength apart from Christ. And sometimes the conditions of weakness when I suffer lack, when I'm abased, when I'm, even when I'm abounding, there's always this instability about money and all this sort of stuff. There is a weakness even associated with abundance. Why? Or you read Ecclesiastes or even Proverbs. Wealth has wings and it can fly away, right? There's this instability. There's a weakness in abounding and there's a weakness in abased, abasement, okay? And, and when we get to the condition of weakness, 
When I am weak, Paul said, 2 Corinthians 12, when I'm weak, then I am strong. Where do I get the strength from? I get it from Christ. I get it from his grace. So I can do, but I can't do it without him. You remember what Jesus said in John's gospel, John 15, I think it's verse 5. Jesus said this, for without me, you can do nothing. Now, I tell you, you know, the older you get and the more intelligent you become, the more knowledge, more knowledgeable you become in whatever field of expertise that you're in, there's a danger of just cruising on autopilot. Just flick that switch. I love cruise control. I love it. Just get on that Bruce Highway and sometimes, I tell you what drives me mad, you set your cruise control, you're doing 110 or whatever it is, 110, <laughs> You're doing 110, and then all of a sudden, there's someone in front of you that's just not doing 110. You've got to flick your cruise control off. It's like, oh, my God. I, but I love cruise control. I love to take the feet off, to steer, you know, where you go. Sometimes, when we become knowledgeable in things, we just hit the cruise control, and we do it because that's what we're used to doing. Preachers get in that frame of mind, you know, pastoring and whatever. We all, no matter what the expertise, no, what it, no matter what the vocation is, we can all put everything on cruise control. We've been doing it for years. I know how to do this. I know how to do that. And uh, God really doesn't need to be involved. But if we want anything of any significance, I said this and I keep saying it, if we want anything of any significance for eternity and for the things of Christ, we must understand that without him, I can do nothing. But with him, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. So the conditions that God allows us to experience to teach us contentment, he also allows those conditions to enable us to handle whatever the condition is. I can do it. I can do it with the help of Christ. And you can do it also with the help of Christ. Paul said, I have learned... I've learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. You learnt that? Are you learning that? Am I learning that? There's so many other scriptures that we can do. go to. Godliness with contentment is great gain. But I want to go to Hebrews. I want to finish with this because we're in, uh, you know, we're talking about this. Hey, Pat, good evening. We're talking about this on Sunday where, where God says through Haggai, I am with you. And I, and I love the fact, and I hope you do as well, and I'm sure you do. I love the fact that Jesus, God, never leaves us nor forsakes us. And listen to what he says here. He says in verse number five, he says, let your conversation. Now, that word conversation doesn't mean, hey, let's have a dialogue together. It means the, con the, the conduct of your life. Okay. He says, let your conversation be without covetousness. And be content with such things as you have. For he has said... I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. So we can be content knowing that God is with us and helps us in life, right? Verse 6, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. The whole idea of God allowing us to experience conditions to help us learn contentment and so on is so that when we get in whatever condition it is, that we can say, the Lord is my helper. The Lord is my helper. He helps me to do what I can't do, obviously, without him. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. School is never, a, we never go on holidays. <laughs> yeah. I love school holidays. I remember we only had three terms and, and Christmas holidays. We had about nine weeks of holidays. Now that I'm 55, I wish there was no school holidays. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, I wish there was no school holidays. What's, what, what? I go around the shopping center because, you know, when you don't have kids, you don't know when school holidays or whatever. And I say, what are all these kids doing around here? Aren't they, why aren't they at school? Well, that's school holidays. Ah, oh, listen, in the Christian life, there's no school holidays. God uses every situation 
and every condition that we go through to teach us important principles, including contentment. Sasha, good evening. So remember that. School's in. School's in. The bell's going. Sit down. Get out your notebooks and your pen and let God teach you. Let God teach you. Amen. All right. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for the lessons of life that you teach us. Thank you for helping us with contentment. And Lord God, we love you and thank you for all your goodness toward us in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. God bless you. Sorry, Sasha, you were late. I hope you got a note. Don't let it happen again. Man alive, talk about teachers. <laughs> Man, you rock up late. Woo, my goodness. Some teachers would really have your guts for gutter. Anyway, have a good night. God bless you. Thanks for joining. Look forward to being with you tomorrow night. Until then, God bless and goodbye for now.